Hey, everybody. We got another guest this week. Uh, this is uh, Dr. DJ Kenny. Now, uh, if you've been on the Soviet Empire uh, Facebook group, I've posted his blog uh, or his uh, podcast a couple of times. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to have him on here. I, you know, I don't even remember how I came across your podcast, but <laughs> I, I really mainlined it from almost beginning to end while I was doing some projects around the house. I was doing a backsplash uh, for the kitchen, and uh, so I had plenty of time to uh, to just sit and listen. Um, but he does an amazing job of ex you know kind of explaining Cold War history. Uh, his his style is unique. I haven't seen anybody else uh, like him. And and most importantly, for my viewers and listeners uh, and readers, he's the opposite of this channel. Okay, if you go to his channel, you'll see you know high quality production values. You'll see uh, he's got an amazing voice and and great equipment. And over here, I'm Dollar Store Alex, and I've got uh, I sound like uh, somebody strangling a cat. So um, please welcome uh, my guest, D Dr. DJ Kenny. Well, hello, and thank you for those kind words. And uh, you sound just fine. <laughs> I, I swear, my real speaking voice is like uh, uh, two octaves lower. But whenever I turn on a camera, I just. It's right up, and I can't stop myself from doing it. Yeah, well, I, I always try to record early in the morning where I when I have a, a good radio voice, solid oh, okay. radio voice. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. I'm I'm really I'm really pigeonholed into the uh, this this time on a Tuesday evening because my wife has piano lessons, and so uh, I have the house to myself. So why don't you give us a few words about your uh, about your podcast? Sure. The Cold War Vault is the name of the podcast. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> it's coming into its third year and a new incarnation. Now, if you're familiar with it, uh, it's it's uh, it's been a little little wild, but I've been retooling it, and um, there's going to be a lot more uh, visual content. And new episodes are are coming out uh, this week. As as we speak, I'm fairly excited about that. The show itself is um is a a scholarly look at history uh, uh, without well, without a uh, it being a drag. I think. Yeah, and not I don't. Exactly. I think you know. I wouldn't. I would not have chosen scholarly uh, as as an adjective. But when you say it, I can see it absolutely 100. percent but as you said, it's not a drag. It's it's very entertaining. You really you really keep it moving. You really well, I guess I mean, history alive. I mean scholarly in that um, in that I I hope I, I use sources uh, sources that are deeper um, and more numerous than you'll get in a ten minute YouTube video. You know, a YouTube history channel, uh, which are entertaining but not necessarily deep. And um, it goes deeper than a, <clears throat> than a Wikipedia article, sure. and, uh, and and I think that some of the sources I use uh, offer some surprising insights. So that's why it's the Cold War Vault, right? Right, going to the vault. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Okay, well, today we're going to discuss one of my favorite movies, and I know I say that every time, but that's because hey, if I'm going to review movies, they might as well be my favorites. Uh, this year, this uh, week, we're talking about uh, the movie Threads uh, from Great Britain. For for those of you who haven't seen it, you you really, if you're into any of this World War III stuff, it's it's an absolute must watch uh, at least once, and for a lot of people, only once. I think I am a bit of a glutton for punishment because I watch this thing, you know, every couple of years. Uh, I can't I can't help myself. I, it's a sickness. Um, this is the movie that might best be known as the British Day After. Uh, it came out the following year in 1984, and uh, and it was a very similar uh, circumstance where we took Middle America and blew that up in uh, in Kansas City. They uh, blew up uh, it was Sheffield in uh, in the United Kingdom. So they, their their tale is a little more urban, and you know they don't have they don't have a lot of farmland uh, in this. But it's very British, and so I, I really do think it's apt to call it the British Day After. But it really does stand on its own uh, as, as a movie. So, so just because it's that gives you an idea of what it's like, it it really doesn't do it complete justice. And actually, it was it was Dr. Kinney's experience with this film 
that made me when I started doing movie reviews, actually, and let me go back and say it was his World War Three movie reviews where he had this amazing style where he took, you know, the the chronology of World War Three and and then talked about uh, a subsection of movies and how that section was represented. So uh, kind of like how I, I have my you know geopolitical buildup. That, that's that's an example of, of a, something we're going to talk about. You know, he would go through, you know, a dozen movies and sort of explain what that was like and how the movie handled it. And I thought that was a really good way to, to go through a movie review. And it actually almost kept me from doing any movie reviews because I thought that was way cooler than anything I was going to come up with. So, um, Thanks. so yeah, the, <clears throat> then one of the things in, in talking about uh, World War Three and movies and all, you, you actually told the story of your introduction to this movie. And I was wondering if you could share that with, with us. Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, I was exposed to this um, film when it was shown in the United States in 1985. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure yeah, how in depth we should go. Um, if you want if you want the whole story, I, I think I'd go through it in the Cold War vault. But in short, uh, it was uh, it was aired on Superstation TBS, <clears throat> Ted Turner's uh, Superstation TBS. Uh, Ted Turner was a big um, anti-nuclear activist and uh, so devo devoted a, a day to this to this film. No commercials. And it just so happened that um my parents left the room for some reason. I was pretty young. My parents left the room for some reason and left it on and and it looked somewhat educational, so they didn't see a big problem and uh, I I sort of watched the the world disint disintegrate in a in a, a post nuclear uh, hellscape uh, before they came back into the room. And I, I sort of swallowed that down for a while and didn't really think about it. But uh, but I, I definitely had some some form of post-traumatic stress disorder from seeing this film as a very young child. I came across the VHS cassette um, years later. I was in high school, came across it. I said, this kind of looks familiar. And I was always into movies like that for some reason. And I, I came across this, took it home, watched it and immediately had this, had this explosive emotional reaction. Cause I realized this was the reason that I had spent my childhood afraid of nuclear weapons and obsessed indeed afraid of, and, and that usually, or it's often goes hand in hand with being obsessed as obsessed with cold war history and nuclear weapons. And so I credit the film with probably probably changing the the course of my professional career well i watched that and then i realized that i'd been exposed to that all those years before and after that uh it was all it was all history all the time for the rest of my professional academic and professional life that's, that's fantastic a, and 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 so you're you're uh you're professing now pardon you're you're a professor right now, right? You're are you uh, giving instruction or mm, the last uh, the last I taught was uh, at Marquette University, um, but after that I've gone to doing a uh, consultancy and and uh, the podcast and and trying to develop uh, some of this media, you know, this little miniature media empire. Okay, it's very miniature, yeah. but I'm trying. I know the, I know the feeling. <laughs> Okay, well, um, from my perspective, I, I, you know, again, I watched the day after uh, when it came out on TV. We sat down as a family. We watched it. I grew up in a military family, and uh, that it, it was. I was I was a bit older than you. I was in uh, in sort of late elementary school, and it it definitely had a profound effect. But I was always told there was always whispers, you know, as as I was growing up. Oh, you haven't seen the you know the, the British have one that's even you know, worse. It's just, it's, it's way bleaker. And, uh, and so I just, I remember hearing about it and it was, it was like rumors almost. And I was actually a, a full grown adult before I saw it. I didn't see it until probably about eight or nine years ago. 
it, it popped up on, I don't even remember where, uh, probably Vimeo or something like that. Somebody had pirated a copy or something. And, and I watched it, uh, you know, from beginning to end and, and it just, it was, it was, it was everything that anybody ever said it was. I was, I was really, really impressed with, with what they put together. Um, and each time I see it, I'm still impressed by, by the way it was constructed, uh, the way that they tell the story. I have a couple of critiques. It's not the perfect movie. Um, for one, I, and you know, <laughs> I feel also silly saying this, but maybe all British people look alike because I had a real hard time uh, telling who some of the characters were. So you'd see a guy show up later and you're like, wait a second, is that, hold on. So, yeah. so I think that I've probably lost some of, uh, some of the effectiveness of the film by trying to figure out who's who. Um, but no, I actually think they, they did a, a great job with it. And so for all the one, all of the movies that we've been reviewing, we go through a couple of different categories. The first one is the geopolitical buildup. So uh, what caused the war to start? The next one is the war in narrative. Now, because most of these are fairly low budget movies, or in this case, a TV movie, um, they're going to explain the war a lot more than they're going to show the war. And so, so you get a lot of war in narrative. The third category is the visual war. That is, okay, how did they take their limited budget and kind of give you the visual effects? Uh, and then finally, we have the aftermath, uh, which is what happens after the war. And this movie is very uh, different than most of the other ones because over half of it deals with the aftermath. Uh, typically, with a lot of these movies, you're looking at maybe 10, 15 minutes of you know, digging out. But... Uh, uh, and then finally, the tropes, just, you know, what are the what are the things that you just have to have in one of these movies? Um, and usually they're quirky and, and sometimes funny, sometimes not. Um, but those those are kind of the categories. And so we'll start with the geopolitical buildup. This one is kind of similar to. Um, I believe it was uh, Countdown to Looking Glass in that it really starts in Iran. So. There is a coup in Iran, and so we have to assume it's the Ayatollah gets deposed and there's new leadership. If that sounds familiar, then you might be thinking of 1952 uh, when kind of a similar situation took place with Mozadik. The Russians, or the Soviets rather, they, they do what they do, and they accuse the CIA of doing what they did. And so they use this as a pretense uh, to send troops into Mashhad over uh, through Turkmenistan, or actually rather the Turkmen SSR. Um, and that's, that's really kind of the opening, uh, opening move there. And it's going to reverberate through the rest of the world, but, but this is kind of our flashpoint. Um, so when you're looking at the Cold War, Dr. Kenny, um, and especially, I'd, I'd say actually even to narrow it down to say, you know, the, the time that was the late 70s to the mid uh, 80s. Um, where do you think uh, Iran stands as kind of a flashpoint? How, how likely? Well, <clears throat> there was a significant, um, a significant popular uh, perception of the events in, in Iran, especially because, uh, because of the revolution uh, and the hostage crisis, seventy nine to eighty, and so it, it was actually it was an interesting way for the filmmakers to go, because previously it would have been um, Berlin, uh, in I think we'll organically figure out how to talk about the war game nineteen sixty five sixty six at some point, but every every uh, flashpoint for for these kinds of uh, earlier films was Berlin, but Berlin had uh, Berlin was in a kind of a stasis. Uh, it wasn't exciting or interesting. But in the early 1980s, the Middle East seemed uh, seemed an exceptionally dangerous place. The Iranian Revolution, but also uh, the 79 invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviets. That's right. So the, so the Soviets were were in the in the region actively and having a very difficult time of it and so these these little conflicts were popping up so i think it's a really interesting way to go uh of course 
there was also a, a, the Iran Iraq war. That's right. And and so this was this was sort of the new the new uh, battlefield in the minds of the public. And I, I think it was it was smart and really interesting. If you're going to have to create a narrative about the cause of the war, then uh, that, yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, yep. Could it could it have been in real life, like as a counterfactual uh, history? Yes, because. Uh, we just saw conflict conflict for years thereafter, and it and it did always have have to do with backing at that time the two ideological sides uh, between Iran and Iraq, with, <clears throat> uh, and and the Soviets and the United States. One is a, a so a social and political conflict, and the other is a, relig- a religious conflict. So so every reason to believe that would be a flashpoint for. Uh, global struggle. Yeah, you know, when I was watching uh, the, the movie again for, for this review, I, I did actually think to myself for the first time, hey, wait a minute, you know, they, they didn't even mention uh, the Iraqis, you know, so we're sending in uh, our two airborne divisions and, you know, the, what the Iraqis are just minding their own business. So I thought that was interesting. <laughs> but at the same time, it's definitely it would just distract from the central focus of the uh, of the of the movie so I, I didn't give them any demerits for it i just i thought it was it was definitely interesting it's it has to be on you know in the in the television in the pub and on the radio in the car right it has to be in the various headlines uh that are uh, seen throughout the younger jimmy's younger sister delivers uh newspapers in the film so it has to be there or it doesn't make any sense. And so you do have to, somebody has to come up with a plausible, a plausible uh, architecture for the end of the world. And I think that's as good as any, especially if you'd like to move it beyond uh, the Berlin, the Ber- tensions in Berlin. Right. And, and that's kind of interesting because uh, when they did the day after it was, it was Berlin. That was the, that was the flashpoint. They, they, they closed Berlin and NATO in, invaded and, and everything just went to hell. Um, so, okay, well, the the Soviets come in in Mershon, and they set up a, ba- a base there. The U.S. sends them an ultimatum, says you need to get the hell out, or you know we're gonna we're gonna send some troops over. Uh, gets a little bit hairy because we lose the USS Los Angeles. Uh, it just goes missing on a routine intelligence uh, uh, mission, and. I'm here to tell you there was nothing. I, okay, look, I'm not telling any secrets, okay? But there was nothing routine about whatever the hell that ship was doing uh, off the coast of Iran. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, but then this one, this one blows my mind. The, uh, the Kirov, which is the largest surface combatant, uh, if you're not counting carriers and amphibians or uh, amphibious uh, assault ships, uh, largest surface combatant since World War II, runs into the USS Callahan. Okay, well, I guess the Callahan might have run into Kirov. Either way, they collided. Uh, And if you're a super nerd on the military hardware side, uh, this might be funny to you because the USS Callahan was one of the four kid-class destroyers that was supposed to go to Iran. Um, So that was supposed to be one of the Shah's destroyers, but when the Ayatollah took over, we said, yeah, we'll go ahead and keep it. so I thought that was a, a kind of a, I don't know if that was intentional or just coincidence, but, uh, but I did think I, that was pretty funny. I did not know that. That's, that is very funny. I, I would tend to think it was not intentional, but uh, who knows? Yeah. They just, they just uh, <laughs> opened up their copy of Jane's fighting ships and, and found right. a uh, suitable destroyer. <laughs> no, um, excellent. <laughs> so once one, you know, with the with the missing submarine and the the surface combatants hitting each other, the U.S. finally does uh, decide to do this. And and for this is the kind of thing that I'm not allowed to do. I don't want to do. But that is make up a unit that doesn't exist. And that is the, so. This is some. This is one of those things where this is so important for my genre and what I write. But I, you know, who ninety eight percent of the people that are going to watch this movie don't really care. Um, I guess that's it. 98% of the people that watch this movie don't care that there's no such thing as the U.S. 10th Airborne Division, but 98% of the people that read my book do care. So 
so it's it's funny when I was when I was writing this down when I was kind of taking notes I was like okay and then we send the 82nd in and I was watching it and I went oh no I've just been translating that in my head every time um but be that here nor there um they we send in an airborne division and start setting up defensive positions to keep the Soviets out of the oil fields because at the end of the day you know this is a a political fight it's a it's a clash of civilizations but it's also a resource grab um you know right now the u.s has uh well actually you know by this point we don't really have very much control over it because it was the ayatollah oh right but we deposed the ayatollah so we're trying to get access to the oil fields and the soviets are basically using you know the allegation that we deposed the shah or i'm sorry deposed the ayatollah so that they can get access to the to the oil fields. So it's uh, it's it's really fascinating to me how it can be two things at once like that. The uh <coughs> sorry. <coughs> I should have muted it. Let's well, you know, not morning drive time radio. My fault. Can... The um the uh yeah, it's uh, absolutely important I think also for the for that period it just fits in with what i said before that that it i i don't mean i don't want to sit i didn't want to say this because it does sound so cynical but it is about resources it is about the oil and you know that would play out over the over the the real history of the region and military conquest in the region over the following decades it it is uh yeah it is it is about that though they never make it a they never and i do think this is important because i do think it would seem too cynical just as a as an aside they never seem to construct an argument or claim that the nuclear annihilation of western civilization is because of oil and uh it was a maybe a gentle balance or maybe others feel differently yeah, I mean, it's really in the entirety of the film, there's only one reference to the oil fields, and it's specifically with regards to the what the Airborne Division is doing. Um, so since the, the Soviets are coming over with you know armored forces, we're sending over a light infantry. Uh, what are they doing? Okay, well, now we know. They're just going to try to, you know, we're, we're not going to try to push the Russians out. We're just going to you know keep them from moving any further in. But then they they... Now, this is the U.S. accusing them, so there's no, I don't know what evidence they would present, but the, the Americans accused the Soviets of moving nuclear weapons into Iran. And this is seen as kind of, uh, you know, the next escalation. And I remember the first time that I was watching this, I remembered thinking, well, that's a very little, little use. I, I don't understand, you know, what, what benefit the Soviets think they're going to get. Uh, out of out of stationing you know what a you know, tactical missiles it, it didn't occur to me at the time uh until they until obviously you get to it in the in the movie that that it's actually nuclear tipped uh sams so surface to air missiles um so so that's really you know that really is an escalation um mm -hmm. okay and then mm -hmm. right after I'm, as soon I'm, as we oh, accuse sorry. them of sending nukes to uh to mashad the uh, Soviets, they forward deploy along the German border, and then they, uh, they shut down uh, the, the, they shut down Berlin. So, so now we've gotten to that point. And, and now it's, you know, it started in, in Iran, but it's getting very real for, for everybody. In fact, once that happens, I think it's only a day or two. Uh, before the U.S. issues a deadline, they basically have an ultimatum with a deadline, and they say, all right, you know, get out or we're going to push you out. Um, and, and so when the deadline passes, we immediately move from uh, the geopolitical background to the war and narrative. So the war starts out with B-52s uh, flying oh, out of Turkey. That's right. So they, they had stationed the B-52s in Turkey. Um, so Isserlink, what's the name of that base? Doesn't matter. Um, and so the, the Americans launch an attack at the uh, Soviet air base, and the Soviets retaliate with a nuclear-tipped uh, SAM. And I'm guessing that's going to be a V-300, um, but if any of you guys have any ideas, uh, just leave them in the comments. Um, 
I, yeah. I have so, a question then. I have a question for you then. Sure. Um, when they move move those uh, those nuclear uh, weapons into Iran, now at some aren't some of those then used to sink the when it really escalates and sink the carriers? You know, okay. I will I will admit um, I do not recall. I know that the Kitty Hawk does get sunk, but I don't remember uh, if they said how that happened. Um, so I'm, I'm actually not sure. Oh, then now uh, see, there's a detail. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. And I'm always <laughs> looking for carriers to get sunk. That, uh, that gets my attention every time. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, so yeah, when they, so, so the, the Soviets launched the first nuke. They're the first one to, to open the atom up. But we immediately retaliate by hitting their air base with a tactical nuke. Um, and I always have a hard time with how long it was between that first exchange and then all hell breaking loose. Um, and, and, you know, panic in the streets of Sheffield. Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts well, on that? Yes, I do. Um, so, <clears throat> so often in the, in media and certainly in the public imagination, the sim the the simpl more simplistic understanding of how things would work. This is also in a in a time when uh, the metaphorical button in many people's minds was a literal button, right. as if Ronald Reagan could push a red button under the desk and uh, launch the uh, the uh, integrated operations plan and end the world. I think that what they're doing what the filmmakers are doing with threads is possibly creating a more nuanced, potentially more realistic scenario that, uh, that takes into account the very real reluctance that there would be both in the Kremlin and the white house to going into a, a full uh, strategic nuclear exchange. Now I can't say whether that would really be the way that it would play out. Um, but it was something new, something that uh, that clearly this film wants to explore, not just to ratchet up tension, though it does that. And I think that as far as a, in a dramatic screenplay, I think it's excellent because uh, so often uh, the, the button gets pushed and uh, things happen so rapidly that within 24 hours, it's it's over or or two days and so in doing that uh they ratchet up the tension so that's a dramatic thing but i think that it may potentially be realistic that every step would be laboriously <clears throat> debated as opposed to as opposed to the clockwork automation right. of armageddon right and uh in you know so off <clears throat> so often World War One is described as a sort of clockwork automation, and and the 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 guns of August become the missiles of October, and right. this metaphor gets carried on that once things get rolling, it just happens without any sort of human intervention. And so I I I think that if you're watching the film for the first time or watching it for the first time again, maybe this is something you could look at uh, as as somebody interested in. The, the Cold War and interested in the politics and, and mechanics of the military and political infrastructure, that, uh, that maybe it would happen more slowly, painfully, uh, inevitably, but perhaps more slowly. Anyway, those are my thoughts. No, and I think you're right. I think that, um, I think that no matter who's in charge, that there will be a degree of that. And then the question is, to what degree? Um, I feel like, so for example, uh, take the Reagan administration versus the Carter administration, you know, I can see that definitely going a lot more slowly under Carter than, than Reagan. Yes. Um, and I'm not going to assign any goodness or badness to either of well, those things, but just well, early that, Reagan, early Reagan. Yeah. Yeah. Later, later Reagan might very well have been more nervous about the scenario. That makes sense. So let's see. Um, then really, you know, as far as, uh, the war in narrative 
goes, it, it really shifts from the narrative to the visual world really quickly. Uh, and and I, I consider this part of the narrative, but um, I still get chills every time that box in the, uh, in the administrative shelter says mm. attack warning red. <laughs> and, and you know it's coming and it's ah see i get i get chills just just talking about it so so that's the end of uh the war in narrative because uh once once that comes now we're gonna we're gonna actually see it play out um well then now, yes then then we get into something very exciting uh because it is different from every other uh film of its kind and i am excited to talk about that so go ahead um, well, okay, so I, I do. I want to go back a little bit um, just to cover the <clears> fact <throat> that this movie, like, like all, like hell, like half of my videos anymore, uh, chock full of stock footage of uh, F4 Phantoms taking off and landing, uh, and C-130s uh, delivering uh, troops and equipment to uh, to faraway battlefields. But once the war actually gets uh, gets kicking, you have actual, I mean, absolute panic on the streets, and and I think the sound of the uh, of the air raid sirens um it's familiar but it's still different and i i don't know if it's just because i know what's coming but i find the the air raid sirens that they used in in this film just really fill me with an existential dread that that generally i don't <laughs> you know i don't get from from something that every saturday we have tornado sirens go off here uh you know just to make sure they still work and and I just I do think that if a tornado comes on a Saturday, we're all we're all screwed. But uh, um, anyway, so that's really kind of the first thing that you see here. You see the people panicking in the streets. There's uh, the air raid sirens going in the back. Uh, and and then we get uh, the actual flash. And, you know, the flash is off screen, but you can you know, you you, you see it come up, you know, come over. <clears throat> um, and they did a great job, I thought, of taking the the mushroom cloud stock footage mushroom clouds and and then you know cutting to the panic in the streets and and everybody's reaction you know looking at it in awe pissing yourself you know whatever uh you know whatever you're going to do at that moment so um and and well, i i, I want to let you because i think you, you're gonna have a lot to, to say on this but i will say to me the most disturbing part of this of this scene has to be the the on fire and melting ET. I don't know what that's about. But no, just you're right. Me out. <laughs> Nick Jackson, uh, Nick Jackson commented on that uh, many times over the years. It was one of his uh, favorite bits. Yeah. <laughs> well, it got my attention. Yeah, really. The uh, okay. Well, let let let's just uh, keep it to that very specific uh, part of the film. The f the first uh, flash that you see, um, Mr. Kemp is in the bathroom at that point. Bloody hell! Um, and it it is a it is a high altitude detonation over the North Sea. And that's an e that's an EMP attack. Now that's interesting because uh, the first EMP uh, to be depicted in film was in the day after, but it was a little bit wonky, not exactly accurate. I think you'll recall the scene of the. Uh, uh, I don't remember all the names, but you know the the fiance. The, uh, who you never see again, his motorcycle dies on the right. highway. Probably not. I mean, it's no electronics when it's running, but that's a different issue. That's a good point. It's like my old Triumph. <laughs> but there were, um, you know, there were very accurate depictions and iron explodes, lights go out. And so it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great moment. Now you only have a few minutes once that happens. Uh, so you know, Mr. Kemp gets out of the bathroom, but uh, <clears throat> the second, uh, then, then you see it on uh, the air base. Uh, there's, and people are still okay. Uh, that's at a distance. That's when Jimmy Kemp starts to run to Ruth's house. Mm -hmm. And I will, uh, I don't know. I don't think we'll have a moment to, to say this. So I'll just say this. I did walk 
in Sheffield, I walked the the film. Uh huh. And um, but there's no reason for him to be. He could not have made it to Ruth's house. It's like six <laughs> miles away. Nobody's going to make it. It's across town. It's crazy. And right. <laughs> but um, but uh, that so that's but but then the 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 intercuts are happening faster and faster because everything's escalating. So from the North Sea detonation and then the one over the air base, uh, and you know that uh, it's going to happen pretty soon. The big mushroom cloud over the high street where the woman urinates herself, which is one of the most just horrifying scenes of any film I've ever seen. Um, They actually did that with a, a big tank of gasoline so it's a real explosion oh, wow. okay. in the distance and it horrified people oh, <laughs> they, I bet. Really th- they really thought something had gone off um so that was that's just a fun production note that's cool uh, but uh as as that's escalating um it goes from and this is i think what they're trying i and successfully to do from distant no no casualties. It's like phase one, you get this EMP and then you get military targets and then counterforce targets and then uh, uh, industrial targets, which of course Sheffield Sheffield. like that. And then as it goes on and eventually we retreat into the bunker with Sutton and the, and the emergency governance, uh, they just continue to bomb. You only hear it in the shaking and the rumbling and it goes all the way to civilian targets. And so that attack sequence is really quite nuanced. And if you, if you study it or watch it in that way with an eye toward the, uh, uh, toward that escalation, it's, it's very well done. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, and they do, they, they do a very good job also of stepping you through it. So, so you don't have to do a lot of guesswork. Um, um, and, and, and actually, I will say that, that I did notice when, when watching it this last time, um, it was the first time I think that I noticed that after they were in the shelter, they were saying, you know, there goes another one. And, and I was thinking to myself, well, maybe that's a secondary explosion, you know, but, but yeah, if they're, they're still dropping bombs, that's. Uh, yeah, I believe, yeah, the line is Jesus Christ, another one. Yeah, right. It's, yep. Uh, yep. it's just still, because at that point it, at that point, it really is out of human hands, and it is simply automated um, counter strikes. Right, so. right. Um, let's see. So we yeah, we got that. Uh, okay, and then um, I, I guess this kind of fits here, um, but that is uh, the the lean to door shelters. Um, <laughs> I thought that was that was so. <laughs> Even at the, the you know, well, I guess the first time I saw it, it was already like, that's not going to do much. That's not going to do hardly anything. Um, that's just going to give you a maybe a slightly more comfortable place to die. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, uh, <clears throat> I think I may or may, may or may not go into it in more detail in one of the episodes of the Cold War Vault. But um, <clears throat> the... Uh, Civil defense of Britain had not updated at all uh, since the 1960s and the days of, uh, uh, mention it again, uh, an, a precursor to, this, to threads is called the war game. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, it came out uh, and was censored and not shown in 1965 it was shown in 1966 only one time and it wouldn't be shown again until 1985 alongside threads one time again but uh but the the door shelter the lean-to door shelter is uh is really a callback to the absurdity of that especially because in the 1980s the civil defense program in the UK was called Protect and Survive. And Protect and Survive uh, was a a series of pamphlets and short one-minute animated films 
that were not meant to be shown to the public until there was an international crisis that could lead to nuclear war. But people were so interested in civil defense as things started to look very bad in the early 1980s that they demanded that they see what the government had for them. What can we do? And so the, uh, the pamphlets showed what you could do. And one was to hide in the basement if you had one. And many did not, because if you're renting or renting or if you're in a council flat, you don't have a basement. Yeah. The Beckett's, Ruth, the other protagonist, the main protagonist, she does have a basement because she's upper middle class. Right. The Beckett's, of course, don't have a basement. The most that they can do is what is obvious to everyone, totally senseless and impotent as a defense. And that is the lean to door shelter of which you speak. But that was official government advice. You, you know what? It would keep you busy until you died. So I guess there's, <laughs> there's some value there. So much of it was inherited from the Second World War. Sure. It, it would do a lot of good. Uh, explosives. For a breaking glass immediately, you know, but in the long term, especially, and it's even referenced in the film with the roof gone as the, as the fallout comes in, it, the breaking glass, the fact that you survived the breaking window makes no difference whatsoever. That's right. And, uh, and as far as the war, uh, the visual war, I think that, uh, the collapse of the civil administration shelter, uh, you know, that that was that was kind of like the big finale there. And, and once that came down, it, we were moving on into the aftermath. OK, so, yeah, the, the shelter collapses or, you know, the, the building, the town hall collapses on top of the shelter. Uh, you know, the lights go out. Everybody's, you know, uh, you know freaking out. And but for the additional explosions that we're going to hear uh, further down the line. Um, that that's pretty much the the end of the war, and we're moving into the aftermath. Um, and I said this at the top of the of the video. Uh, we're not even halfway through the movie, and and we're we're starting with the aftermath. So I think that that was a very intentional uh, choice by the production crew to to basically, <laughs> and I don't want to say this the wrong way, but to to, to basically sternly lecture us about uh, how bad this is going to be and, and how, how we should do everything we can to make sure that it doesn't happen. Yeah, I um, think that's right. Yeah. And so, yeah, we see that um, we never see Jimmy again, right? He's, he's just gone. Right. Jimmy, uh, as he starts to run across town to Ruth's house, is presumably taken out by the direct hit on Sheffield. Yeah. The Probably. industrial area of Sheffield. Yeah. And then, um, so I don't want to get too far ahead. Well, his so we'll, friend, yes, his friend. Yeah, we'll talk Right, about. right. But he just stayed under the truck then? Under the I, truck, yeah. Okay. Oh, and, and I guess we should say, we should explain what the hell we're talking about. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I can't remember his name now. Oh, my goodness. Oh, he says it once, uh, Jimmy's friend. He just yeah. says when he meets Ruth, Jimmy's friend. And I, I've, I've seen the film so many times and I still don't. Bob. Bob. Bob, Bob, Jimmy's, Bob yeah. Jimmy's mate. That's what it was. Jimmy's mate, yeah. Uh, so, so okay, so so yeah, that that's kind of an interesting um, juxtaposition. You know, you have the the guy that that stays behind and lives, and then the guy that was you know trying to to go forward and and doesn't make it. Um, and then you have uh, uh, Ruth is surviving in the basement with her mother, her father, and her grandmother, mm -hmm. and you know you can't. You can't predict how you would act or react, but man, I think that if I were a septuagenarian plus that I don't think I'm going into the shelter, man. <laughs> I don't I don't see how that's a net positive for anybody. Well, uh, remember, and it certainly didn't work out for uh, for the grandmother who. who no, no. But I, I wanted to say there is such an undercurrent, both in the real world through the civil defense and just in the popular imagination, an undercurrent of World War II history and the Blitz. Yeah, yeah. And so when you're looking at someone of that age, uh, I, I believe that it would be assumed that she is, she just doesn't, can't imagine what a nuclear war is. She's imagining the Blitz again. Yeah, that and, okay. Oh, and just as a, a, a side note for people who are interested, 
that's a great segue into the film uh, When the Wind Blows, the animated film. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, there's a, an entire element there of the elderly woman who who knows that the war will be okay because Uncle Joe will save them. But of course, it's Joe Stalin that's nuking the country. Right, right, right. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, As actually, I, I will say that um, this that that these sorts of movies. Obviously, I hadn't seen Threads yet, but but on the beach and and the day after for sure uh, led to one of the earliest. Uh, and I don't really want to say conflicts, but uh, breaks between my father and I when it came to something geopolitical, and that was. Uh, no, Dad, I really do believe that the living will envy the dead, and I don't want to be on that side of the equation. They call me a, a moral coward if you must, but <laughs> you know, I grew up on military bases, and and so we always just thought, yeah, let, let's uh, you know, let's just go out, let's let's go and watch the bomb. <laughs> you know? Although that's a bad idea too, because then you'll be blinded, and then you'll be in a lot of pain before you die. But you know, just. Uh, yeah, don't try too hard was kind of the uh, my Gen X philosophy when it came to, uh, to trying to survive a nuclear war. You know, just going to die tired, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, one problem. Uh, well, I actually don't know where we are in the narrative here, but one problem is, is that the, the vastness of the United States in a scenario like uh, the day after um, and is kind of as expanded upon and sort of fetishized in something like Red Dawn mm -hmm. is that you can get away from it and you can survive. You can do something else to to uh, further your life and fight or create something new. Britain is so small and closed. I think right. that that claustrophobia does beset Ruth as things go on. She does move to the countryside. Mm -hmm. And she does survive for the remaining 13 years of the uh, of her life in the countryside. But that's her only escape is kind of it's still under the, the heavy hand of the post-war government. But she kind of gets away. But there's no hopping onto a sailboat and heading to Australia. She's stuck right. there forever. Right. Yeah. And, and I did notice that that. Um... I think it was the recommendation was that they were supposed to shelter in place for 14 days. Um, and I think the only people that we followed that managed to make it to 14 days were the, uh, were the civil administration uh, who yeah. didn't do it by choice. <laughs> right. They, yeah, they were. So when the were, town hall and for, you know, for the people that are following along uh, when the town hall collapsed on top of their shelter, they're basically now buried under, under a ton of rubble and, you know, they're they're trying to run operations. And frankly, I mean, I got to say, kind of doing a pretty good job as far as I can tell. I mean, you know, with what they've had to play with, um, right. <laughs> you know, yeah, OK, we're shooting looters. That's not a great thing. But OK, if you can give me another you know, way to, to try and get this under control, let me know. Oh, and I think the most uh, the most terrifying phrase in the whole aftermath was when one of the administrators says, I need that food to force people to work. Right. And it's like, ouch, but she's totally got a point. And that mm -hmm. I always figure that it, when it comes down to a situation like that, I really think that order is going to break down even, even more than it did there because they still managed to have a, you know, a civil authority. They still had somebody was still running the show and, and they were still mm -hmm. providing services. I mean, you know, food distribution was happening. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't enough food, but Oh, and then there's that that terrible line about how the more people that starve to death, the more food there is for everybody else. Oh, right. Yeah, the, the, the cruel irony of that. Um, and that, yeah, that's true. And civil authority was breaking down in a uniquely British way. Right. Yeah, Not, I think I think I think that's yeah, right. If that I, were if that were you know some uh, urban America, it would have been a uh, food wouldn't have been your your major uh, trading. Uh, source it would have been ammunition um right, you know, right. everybody the, uh, taking their own yeah the, the most of the editions the dvd and blu-ray editions uh have the iconic 
cover, the same cover, and it's the traffic warden mm-hmm. guarding the the impromptu prison at the tennis courts. Right. And uh, that's the that's sort of what I mean by a uniquely British way. It's obviously imprisoned all of these looters and other people who've done something, and the only guard you can find is a traffic warden, which is like a meter meter maid, a sort of a lesser police officer and right. um and and they're not really knocking down those fences they're sort of still playing the game and i right. think people people continue to play the game in the film until food really becomes an issue and that's when you get a few scenes of uh, uh people being shot looting and and when things get really bad there's some still images of uh summary executions as well Mm -hmm. yeah and i don't know why this particular scene speaking of food running out uh always always sticks with me but uh when they when they actually uh they eat the sheep or the um the the ram that they that they come across and they're like hey it's got a thick coat it's probably fine (laughs) it's a very that's a that's a very deep scene because it deals with a few a few things it deals with <clears throat> it deals dramatically with uh, hunger you know supplies but also not just the fact that the sheep clearly is irradiated but the general public misinformation or lack of education about the actual risks right you know, and that's something that's just buried in that in that scene. It, uh, Bob says, you know, um, it's got a thick coat. It wouldn't, have, you know, it wouldn't be radiation. Ruth says, well, sheep don't die of cold. That's right. And he says, well, you'd be able to taste it, wouldn't you? And she says, oh, I don't know. And so there's this, you know, that that's sort of spooky because watching that it's like wow what don't i know or what wouldn't people know they do eat the sheep in any case right and and i mean i can see you know one hunger i mean you know you can you can talk yourself into a lot of uh, a lot of you know things when you're when you're that hungry i'm sure um and especially again like you said you don't know you know it's like well radiation it's on the outside of the sheep and you know and, okay so they don't eat the lungs because it was breathing you know and and you know <laughs> Stay away from the GI tract because it was drinking water and, and eating radioactive stuff. Just, uh, it's an absolutely haunting scene. Yeah, yeah, and and just chowing down on a <laughs> on Raw. basically roadkill. Yeah. yeah, that that mm, that was that was tough. Um, but okay, so and something that we didn't even talk about um, <laughs> because of the weakness of my format was. Uh, Ruth's pregnant during almost yes. the entire, probably the entire, uh, the entire movie. Um, yes, so- she she gets pregnant in the very first scene in the car, mm-hmm. as the first uh, jets fly over to Finningley. It's RAF Finningley, right? I believe so. And uh, she's pregnant the entire time. In fact, the the film, the film began that first pre-war segment. If you're, if anybody watching is uh, interested in this type of film stuff, um, it was intentionally designed to look like um, a kitchen sink drama, which is uh, sort of a working class style that was very popular at the time. So it was about a sort of semi-employed or unemployed family kind of a class struggle working and so yes the the fact that she gets pregnant she's pregnant and jimmy wants to do the right thing and they try to get the apartment all of that follows a a format of something that you would have found on the bbc at any given time in the late 70s and early early 80s like for on play for today for instance and so kind of putting everybody at ease yeah it's a familiar format like a soapy format Mm -hmm. uh, that you're about to you're about to take that familiar format that working class guy who just wants to do something or break out of his life and you're about to just drop nuclear weapons on them yeah yeah that'll definitely ruin your day but- so it it had it sort it had sort of an additional uh, cultural element that i think that 
Americans like us watching it or maybe even Britons today might not even appreciate. Yeah, I had no idea. It's fascinating. But she she actually okay, so she's pregnant throughout uh, you know, the first two thirds, three quarters of the movie. Uh, but then then she does actually manage to successfully have birth or give birth in a uh, in a very traumatic scene um, where she's essentially all alone. And, uh, you know, that that baby was born, uh, you know, through the grace of God and 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 her will. Um, and so now we have something new that that <laughs> I don't know any other. Uh, films that were dealing with this kind of uh, World War III thing um, really gave us, which was the next generation. Um, so this is a child who is born into a world that was destroyed, you know, what, eight months before she was born? Um, and and so, yeah, it's it it really kind of sets us up to see how bad things can get. Um, and And again, like I said, when the when the producers were deciding how to, how to set this up, they gave us so much time because we would, you know, so much, uh, when I say time, I'm talking about, they give us an hour um, and, and to cover a lot of years. Um, and so we do, you mentioned that Ruth made it uh, something like 13 years. Um, I believe it's 13. Yeah. Actually, I, I have it. Um, I had put, put this, in my notes, I think it's interesting um, if it's right in front of me. I think it is. Yeah, the touchstones are um, from the beginning, four months, seven months, ten months. This is all after the war. Right. After the war. Four months, seven months, ten months, a year, ten years, and 13 years. So it's a vast expanse of time. And, yeah. and we watched the crop failures because of the um, nuclear winter. Um, so, so the attack happened in the spring and so the, the crops that you were expecting to get, um, you know, were, were nowhere near what the yield would have been if they had had sunlight. Uh, and, and this, and I, I did think this was interesting. Um, they they say that it was the, because of dwindling fuel supplies, this is the last time that they're going to have, uh, tractors and, uh, harvesters to, to bring in the crop. And, and part of me was wondering at the time, and, and I guess you don't really, you can't think that far in the future, but um, wouldn't it have been more efficient to save that for the next season? But then if everybody dies this season, cause they can't get enough food, so you don't really have a choice. It is. It's interesting because uh, in everything I've looked into um, both related to the film and just related to, this kind of post-attack planning, nobody plans that far ahead. Right. Nobody yep. planned that far yep. ahead. And especially in, in Britain, there's very specific plans, and they're represented in the film, very specific plans for the immediate post-attack period. And, and so you see grain depots guarded, you see food depots guarded, things are distributed at least semi-efficiently. But after that first uh, year there is just absolutely no planning right in the united states or in britain and uh, as far as i know i've never heard of anything in the soviet union but of course it's a different discipline entirely to try to crack crack sure. uh, their archives yeah and so she gives birth and then we get um so yeah, she lived for uh, so yeah, thirteen years, uh, and then her daughter goes on. Uh, and I know I'm I'm kind of kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but uh, we are kind of running short. Um, but her her daughter goes on to uh, to show us what the civilization kind of looks like uh, as as she's coming of age. And the thing that I found most fascinating, and I believe in one hundred percent, is the degradation of language in the next generation. Um, without any formal schooling, without any structured education, um, there's no way the language is gonna is gonna hold for for very long. So I really yeah. liked that that aspect of it. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people when I'm talking to them about this, they kind of they kind of blow that off and and think that it was uh, you know a little over the top. But uh, no, I believe it 100. percent if, if, if especially now that I'm older and I had uh, I was a, a Russian linguist for the Navy. Uh, and I can't speak a damn word or a, okay, I can speak some, but you know, I, I can hardly speak the language at all. 
because I haven't been using it. And so I, I can 100% see the language just, you know, going down uh, incredibly fast like that. Yeah, <clears throat> that's, a, um, that's a great point. I think that it was a fair point that the filmmakers made that um, Barry Hines, the writer, he included it for a reason. It's, it's very difficult to watch the film and understand exactly how specific the degradation is. If you get the screenplay, which uh, is available on Amazon, I've uh, never, never seen an online version, but if you get the screenplay, you can actually read what's being said in the interaction between Ruth's daughter and Gaz and the two boys, mm -hmm. one of whom becomes the father of her child in that barn. And, and you realize that they are speaking English and it's not that far off, but they're using Sheffield and Yorkshire slang. Yeah. Were they, uh, were they referring to the to rabbits as conies? Is that right? Conies. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, yeah, they're talking about the rabbit and everything's just sort of this slang. And, and so it, it makes a, I think it's I think it's a good argument for the way that it was written if you can actually read it and say oh yeah that just makes makes more sense it's not just it's not something totally absurd. Uh I think it's important or or might be notable for people watching to point out the the book Ridley Walker at this point. Ridley Walker uh I off the top of my head I don't remember the can't remember the author. Um Anyway, the entire book is written in um, in a sort of failed lesser English after a nuclear war. Oh wow! So uh, it, and um, and it's it's really worth worth uh, looking at for that reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that 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 makes sense. You know, I think maybe it's because of uh, uh, my background in foreign languages, but uh, I really didn't have that hard of a time following them. <laughs> yeah. You know, I could kind of, I could see where they were going. I could use context clues. Um, but so, yeah, then um, that, that really kind of ushers us in. You mentioned that uh, uh, one of those fine gentlemen uh, became a father, sort of. Um, Indeed. <laughs> in what is definitely the, the most disturbing uh, uh, aspect of the whole movie. Um, and that is that Ruth's granddaughter, uh, actually, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl, I don't think, um, Ruth's we grandchild don't. is stillborn. And um, it's definitely one of the most traumatic, so in a movie that is just one bummer after another, this, uh, this is absolutely the, the cherry on top, the exclamation point at the end of the sentence. Um, and, and so... It's not explicitly said whether the entire next generation would be infertile, but you have to believe that fertility rates are going to take a huge hit um, just because the body is fighting off, uh, you know, the after effects of, of radiation and malnutrition and, uh, you know, a whole host of, of comorbidities that, that are just going to absolutely wreck um, uh, mm -hmm. fertility. So, yeah, it's the reality of, uh, mutation rather than the, the the science fiction thrill of mutation that's right no x-men were born that day no not at all and and indeed we're not entirely sure that ruth's daughter is stillborn i want to point that out it's never clear it may simply be that it's a a completely um insensitive breathing lump of tissue because of, the, of that. because of the way that the uh the nurse bundles it and uh and leaves the face exposed it, i've done a lot of thinking about it especially in the way that the actress portrays the horror of seeing the child mm -hmm. it is um it's it's just meant to instill uncertainty you know, and it does, it does that uncertainty and terror. Yeah. Because I have not that, cons mm -hmm. considered that that's, that's a, that's a very interesting point. The, uh, of course, uh, it's, in, uh, we should remember that, that she, Ruth's daughter is intellectually impaired because of, uh, radiation in utero. Sure. Probably. Yeah, 
along with other things, malnutrition in, in utero. And so she's going to pass on some other some other issues, but she's lived her entire life in a heightened in an environment of heightened radiation. Right. It just becomes completely un, uncertain what effects that's going to have. And remember, this is concentrated. This isn't someone living out in the American plains that can kind of get away from it only when the wind blows in a certain way. These, right. these people are on the island of Britain, completely inundated in the uh, effects of the Third World War. Yeah, it's very sobering. It really, it really, uh, it really is, especially you know in today's political climate, where for the first time in in thirty years, we're we're taking it uh, very seriously again. So I think that uh, you know, just uh, and you know, I, I realize we're kind of skipping the tropes, but to be honest, we've already kind of talked about them. They're they're sprinkled in throughout the uh, throughout the review. Um, so I think that it'd probably be a good idea to kind of kind of bring this to a close uh, on that okay. and to say. Um, if you're at all concerned about uh, a nuclear exchange, uh, I 100% recommend you watch this movie. It's not going to be a, a good time. Um, you know, it's it's definitely not a uh, Friday Night Family movie, but it is a a realistic depiction of what something like this could look like. And 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 I mean, don't get me wrong, we have not improved. I don't think our uh, civil. The only difference between now and, and then is that we're all going to get a text message before the, the first one goes off. Um, if, that's if that's the lucky. real improvement because we certainly aren't going to be running off to our, our fallout shelters, um, you know, yeah. and, and I can't imagine that, we've, that FEMA has been taking this particularly seriously, um, you know, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So no, there's no civil defense program. Um, there's no central authority that can deal with it in the United States, at least. Uh, if if anything like that were to happen, you'd be very much on your own. I think uh, the first time I really, really thought about that deeply was uh, Katrina. Mm -hmm. And I realized yeah. how impotent FEMA really had become. Right. Since FEMA had inherited the mantle of civil defense, mm -hmm. civil defense administration and and all of its precursor organizations. And I, I realized that they, they could barely hand out MREs. <laughs> they could so barely get water bottles gonna, out of a uh, warehouse. You're not going to get any help. Nope. No. <laughs> so again, embrace the blast wave. And uh, Well, I tell you what, Dr. Kenny, it was great talking to you. I really <laughs> enjoyed this. Um, I, I hope we can do it again sometime. I'd love to. I could talk another hour just on the uh, science of uh, threads and how accurate the science was and how the filmmakers integrated that. So it's really a yeah, fascinating I would, I would film. I would absolutely test. take you up on that. Um, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and leave a, a link to your podcast in my uh, in the description of this video. Okay. And see, there we go. I'm, I'm uh, strangling a cat again. The... Uh, the podcast is the Cold War Vault. This is uh, Dr. DJ Kenny. Uh, it's one of my favorite podcasts, so go give it a listen. And uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Good night.